neurosurgeon and neuronavigational equipment. He utilizes the concept of keyhole neurosurgery, minimizing the damage to surrounding brain, vascular, and soft tissue structures. Dr. Louis believes that most brain and scalp-based tumors can be resected through a minimal invasive approaches and taking advantage of the natural anatomical corridors. This philosophy has been demonstrated to decrease post-operative pain, minimize neurological complications, and shorten the length of hospitalization, resulting in better outcomes for his patients. Since 2015, Dr. Louis has been involved with the development and implementation of virtual and augmented reality technologies for preoperative simulation, rehearsal, and intraoperative navigation. The 3D virtual reality augmented reality platform is provided by Surgical Theater and was developed based on flight simulator technology from F-16 fighter jets. This technology allows the surgeons to literally rehearse complicated operations in virtual reality, giving them the opportunity to visualize critical anatomy a priori and navigate potential pitfalls. The results are making the operations safer and more effective for patients. Under his guidance, Hogue Neuroscience Institute has become the highest volume center for augmented reality in neurosurgery in the United States. Dr. Louis heads several projects to expand the applications of these technologies in neurosciences. This includes virtual reality-based meditation to help nurses with workplace related stress, virtual reality applications for neuro rehab and virtual reality-based therapies for decreasing opiate consumption and addiction. He's also part of the DSR-30, which is working with NASA on preparing the astronauts for the Mars mission, which is scheduled in 2030. He has recently spoken as an invited guest lecturer at numerous national and international conferences, including Becker's, HIMSS, Congress of Neurological Surgeons, and Mount Sinai School of Medicine Symposium on Digital Neurosurgery. His specialty is coordinating uses of advanced technologies in neurosciences across the patient care continuum. Currently, he's overseeing the widespread implementation of VR and AR across several institutes at Hogue, including neurosciences, cancer, and women's health. Thank you, Dr. Louis, and please, you can proceed. Thank you, Dr. Costa, and I, I appreciate you guys having me today. Thanks, Dr. Monteith and Dr. Eskuyan uh, for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen here today. Let's see, sure. Okay, hopefully you guys can see that, my PowerPoint. Yeah, perfect. Right. So, so what we're going to be talking about today is, is the use of advanced visualization technologies in neurosurgery and how these are solving problems uh, that currently exist uh, in our existing uh, techno techniques and, and surgical approaches. So I'm going to start off today with what we call what I call the five problems in neurosurgery. Number one, traditional systems force surgeons to visualize images through a radiologist's point of view. And we're going to look at why this is the case. Number two. There is no way, or there was previously no way for a surgeon to practice an operation on a specific patient prior to surgery. Number three, that residents increasingly have fewer opportunities for hands-on learning. Number four, that patients themselves do not understand DICOM images, and we go to great lengths to try to help them understand them, but it's still a significant challenge. And number five, that traditional navigation systems require surgeons to divert their attention away from the operative field thus interrupting the operative flow. So just a bit of a background, it was 1885 was the first known reported case of resection of a cerebral tumor. Uh, this case was a 25 year old male uh, and the tumor was discovered entirely based on symptoms before we had any imaging of the brain, uh, but they were able to successfully localize the tumor using known maps. Uh, they were able to use what we now call Taylor Houghton lines in order to localize the tumor accurately in the mid portion of the central sulcus. And actually, even without anesthesia or antibiotics, we were able to successfully resect the tumor. Unfortunately, the patient died about a month later from an infection, again, because there was no um, antibiotics available. But the, the key take home was that this is the first time in human history that we know of that humans were able to successfully intervene on the brain to remove a tumor. Fast forward, you know, 90 years, the MRI uh, comes into play, which has dramatically changed our ability to visualize not only anatomical structures within the brain, but also pathological structures within the brain. But because this was 
you know, a, an invention or a production of a combination of radiologists and physicists, the images are given to us in these kind of cross-sectional planes, which are given to us in a standard format of upside down and backwards, uh, which we are forced to then reconstruct these images in our mind, which turns out we're not very good at. In 1987, another large advancement was the introduction of intraoperative navigation. This technology was actually based on technology from the 1600s uh, when sailors navigating uh, used sextant arms in order to, to navigate using stars. Um, however, this, uh, this was a, a big leap forward for neurosurgery because it enabled us to start to work towards less and less invasive surgery. Rather than having to open up, you know, remove a huge craniotomy flap, we can start to become more and more precise with our localization of the lesions and therefore our selection of approach. Oh. There have been a number of other enabling technologies which have advanced the field, advanced imaging such as tractography and functional MRI. The development of refined instrumentation which allows us to work through these smaller openings. The use of things like the Doppler vessel probe and ultrasound. And some of these areas are areas where we had to borrow technology from other fields. For example, obstetricians have been using ultrasound to look at the babies in, inside the uterus for 75 years. However, neurosurgeons kind of, we think highly of ourselves. So we think, well, that's good for the OB guy and doctors, but it's not so good for the brain. Turns out it's an great imaging technology for the brain. And in fact, it's the only real time imaging that we have to use during surgery. And finally, endoscopy. Again, general surgeons have been using endoscopy, laparoscopy in the abdomen for 75 years for removal of the appendix and the gallbladder. Again, neurosurgeons kind of, were, well, that's good for the general surgery guys, but we're brain surgeons and, you know, it's not so, not, not good enough for us. In reality, when we looked at it, that combined with the advancements in the resolution of the imaging, it's ideally suited for a number of neurosurgical cases to allow us to get minimal access to many different areas of the brain. However, even with these advancements, as of 2019, there are still numerous problems in neurosurgery. This is a patient that had a craniopharyngioma, and rather than having an endos you know, endoscopic endonasal or even a supraorbital or a keyhole approach, had a large bifrontal craniotomy to resect it, ended up having infection of the bone flap, uh, and now is left with this terrible cosmetic uh, and functional deficit. So that leads us to problem statement number one. The traditional systems force surgeons to visualize images through a radiologist's point of view. As we said, this is the kind of traditional image. This is a left-sided glioblastoma kind of bridging the motor and sensory cortex. And we're given these kind of coplanar images, which are cross sections that are orthogonal. And we have to try to take these and reconstruct them in our mind. I, I use the analogy of this is like taking a flip book and kind of scrolling through and seeing the different slices of Mickey Mouse kind of moving his arm up and down uh, or, you know, the old school black and white cartoons where we have to kind of, you know, piece together the story. We, even with advanced imaging technologies like diffusion tens tensor imaging, we still have to take the two dimensional imaging and then try to reconstruct a three dimensional model in our mind. So it's hard enough to remember normal anatomy, uh, you know, in detail. Um, never mind this specific patient's anatomy, and then you take this specific patient's anatomy while it's displaced, and then try to reconstruct that in in three D. So rather than looking at these what I call radiologist view. Nowadays, we can use what I call a surgeon's view. This is the same patient, the same MRI, those same two data sets, so taken from the stealth MRI as well as the DTI. And with this image, I'm able to see the location of the tumor. I'm able to see the location of important veins on the surface, which I obviously want to avoid, both in my craniotomy and my approach. I'm able to inspect where, where the, the corticospinal tract is displaced, splayed around the tumor. Deeper to it, I'm able to see the visual fibers. And with this, I'm able to plan a better approach. I can see the sylvian vessels coming in as I slice into the brain. So I can give myself what I call the surgeon's eye view in order to better imprint in my mind where the relevant anatomical structures are going to be for this particular patient. I, before I was a neuro, neurosurgeon, I was a neuroanatomist. This is what I love to do is teach neuroanatomy. And we, we all miss Dr. Roten. And those of you who have heard Dr. Reba speak, I mean, this is what we tr do as neurosurgeons again and again and again, studying the three dimensional anatomy and trying to develop that in our mind's eye, that see through visualization. However, the ability of various surgeons to do this is not, not everyone is Al Roten. Not everyone is, is Dr. Rebus. So this technology 
allows us to have those same abilities and rehearse and simulate. And again, it's not taking it in an anatomical model or a cadaver, it's taking it in this specific patient. So the ability to have a surgeon's eye view of all the relevant structures within one image is really a significant leap forward as compared to looking at traditional MRI images. So you just look at this, again, same patient, same MRI, which is more helpful? This image here, glioblastoma, this image here. So we, we, I look at this and as I start to look at the image on the right, I can start to think through how the operation is gonna look and actually project and predict the surgical corridor. And based on this, I'm able to choose where's the best approach, not in a cookie cutter way, but in, for this specific patient. So radiologist view, surgeon's eye view. Problem statement number two. There is no way, or there was no way to practice an operation on a specific patient prior to surgery. So in the book, Skill, Chris Ahmad, who's the orthopedic surgeon for the New York Yankees, talks about the similarities between elite athletes and elite surgeons. And the major difference, there's many similarities in hours of preparation, the level of skill it takes, the number of years. But the major difference is that when Michael Jordan started playing for the Bulls, or even when he was six times world champion, he didn't stop practicing, he practiced six days a week, shooting free throws, shooting three pointers, dribbling, dunking. As surgeons, we don't have that ability. We practice, it's called the practice of medicine because we are practicing on human beings, hoping to make ourselves better over time. But other than maybe an occasional cadaver lab, we have not really, until virtual reality, have the ability to practice an operation on a specific patient prior to surgery. But this has been studied going all the way back to 2008. And this data has been repeated at numerous institutions, but using virtual reality for rehearsal or simulation prior to surgery leads to a change in the plan approximately a quarter of the time. So in this study, it was 23% of the time. Other ones have shown 24 or 25%. This one here, 88% of the time, virtual reality rehearsal led to a good or very good improvement in the craniotomy planning. In addition, more than three quarters of the patients, let, uh, the surgeon said it led to a substantial improvement in their intraoperative spatial orientation. So helping us get closer to that level of three-dimensional spatial awareness that Al Roten and, and Dr. Rebus speak about. This technology is, is what gives us that, and it can give it to us across the spectrum, whether you're a first year, year intern or a seasoned surgeon, each patient's anatomy is different, and that's the key. It's not possible to memorize all the variations of the locations of where the sylvian vessels are going to be moving in relation to the tumor. But with patient-specific reconstructions, we're able to simulate that in advance. This is an example of a patient where I had a, cl a clinoidal meningioma. He was losing vision in his right eye. Based on the DICOM images, the two-dimensional images, I had selected preoperatively a superorbital approach, so an eyebrow craniotomy to sneak in over it. This guy, you know, is a young guy, 40 years old. So, when, but when I did the preoperative simulation, I can see here the, you know, pretty typical clinoidal meningioma up against the optic nerve. But when I did the fly through here, what I realized is, yeah, sure, I'm going to be able to get to this part of the tumor, but there's a little tongue of tumor right down here behind the superior orbital fissure that I didn't realize I wasn't gonna be able to get to from the DICOM images. Rather than making that mistake in the patient, I made it in the virtual reality. And I said, you know what, instead of a superorbital, let's try a mini terional, let's try an approach from the side. And in this case, same size, you know, about a silver dollar size craniotomy down the sphenoid wing and a straight shot at the tumor, including this little tongue that's hanging back down here, just in inferior and lateral to the superior orbital fissure. What I did is make this mistake, rather than make it on the patient, I made it in a virtual reality system, changed the plan, used the VR system to explain it to the patient, and was able to get the complete tumor resection and recover his vision, and he went home on postoperative day one. So in, in this particular case, this saved this patient from having residual tumor or from me struggling through to try and get to a place which wasn't really within my line of sight. And what that does is it, the, the, the simulation allows the surgeon to predict the line of sight, not based on their past experience of other patients, but in this specific patient, the, what, the surgical corridor you choose will give you this exact line of sight. Another study here from Mount Sinai University showing that both residents, fellows, and faculty planning 
cases, first using standard DICOM images and then using virtual reality, 24% of the time, VR preoperative simulation led to a change in the surgical plan. This is another study uh, regarding virtual reality simulation. This one in regards to aneurysm clipping. Uh, this was done at JFK Hackensack at University Medical Center. And what they found here, the significant thing they found here was an 80 minute reduction in the procedural time for clipping aneurysms when the preoperative simulation was done in order to prepare, in order to simulate and position and choose the clip and get the angle and do it again and again preoperatively so that the, when they're in surgery, it feels like deja vu, they do it again. And this was actually kind of surprising. I mean, 80 minutes is a large amount of time to be saving, uh, you know, and this is 20 patients, so it's not an, an insignificant number. So an 80 minute saving time on average by doing a simulation first, again, because of this deja vu feeling. Another case, a, a series of cases published uh, for my institution, Hogue, as well as with Stanford, NYU, uh, and JFK, uh, showing a wide variety of complex cases where the virtual reality simulation led to a change in the plan where we took an approach we might not have considered had we only been using two-dimensional imaging. And, and again, it's because of the ability to see the surface vessels, the tumor, the brain cortex, the sulci, the, the, the DTI, all in one image, we can select the exact right trajectory and minimize the size of it in order to get to the best possible approach for this particular patient. Problem statement number three, residents have fewer opportunities for hands-on learning. I know you guys are a teaching institution at Swedish, at Hogue, we have some fellows, but not in neurosurgery. But the reality is that nowadays with work hour restrictions, with increased oversight and decreased autonomy, residents have fewer opportunities for hands-on experience, period. Now, there are some solutions to this. Cadaver labs, which is kind of my, my whole background through my whole life is anatomical studies in cadavers. However, they don't have pathology. They don't have a clinoidal meningioma or a petroclival meningioma that you can approach. You can practice the approach, but still it doesn't tell you whether you're gonna be able to get the specific corridor you need in this specific patient. In addition, they don't, they're expensive. I mean, in order to have and maintain a lab and then bring in cadavers every time you need to do it, it's expensive. So yes, you can do it a couple of times a year and I do this and I used to run the lab at University of Virginia. And I, I know that I've done a lot of work with Shane Tubbs who was previously uh, with you guys. Uh, and the, the, but the reality is it's not something you can do for each specific patient and on a regular basis. And it's not repeatable. Once I drill down the clinoid on one side, I, I, I do the other side and that's it. That's all I get out of that head out, or out of that uh, specimen. So with, with virtual reality, we're able to do it again and again. This is a, public, uh, a paper from Walter Jean's group showing the studying the, the benefits of a limited orbitotomy uh, for the superorbital approach. So again, choosing in VR prior to the patient is it necessary to do it, you know, to drill down a specific structure in this case, case? In which cases is it going to benefit you? Fortunately, you don't have to make generalizations because you can actually try it on this patient with individual 360 reconstructions. So this is a the resident training lab at Stanford where each individual uh, resident has a seat. This is Dr. Steinberg. Uh, and before these complex cases, he actually flies the residents through. Now, you know, I, one thing I don't do at Hogue is get to train residents and I miss it dearly. Um, but if I were training residents and the residents, you know, seen a whole handful of cases and has, you know, learned how to close the skin and has learned how to put plate the bone flap and then says, okay, coach, put me in. I'm ready to clip the aneurysm. I would say, okay, show me on the 360 model, you know, put position the patient, position the head upside down, backwards with a 30 degree tilt. Show me, you know, that you're going to be able to get to the, you know, to the, uh, the aneurysm safely. Show me you know what the surrounding vessels are and what they're going to be. Show me you can select in VR what the proper clip is going to be for the right angle. Uh, do it in VR. And then I think you're ready to get in the game. The, the comparison is, you know, we don't let fighter pilots or even commercial pilots go up and fly a hundred million dollar airplane without simulating for thousands and thousands of hours beforehand. Even before specific missions, even in experienced pilots, they simulate it in a simulator before they get go, go up in the air. This is the way it should be done in surgery now as well. If you're having, I mean, there's certain things that are relatively simple that you mean a laminectomy that probably doesn't need to be simulated in advance, but tumors and aneurysms and AVMs where the anatomy is not only complex, but specific and individual to the patient, the residents need to be rehearsing this. They, they need to be simulating it until they can get it right. 
and it helps them improve their three-dimensional spatial awareness. There is no better way to teach neuroanatomy than in virtual reality. When I'm explaining this to whether it's a resident or another surgeon or a patient, they just get it much more quickly because it's, it's in 3D. They're able to kind of rotate it into position and understand, okay, coming off at two o'clock is going to be the frontopolar branch. When we do this, when we help residents learn this way, I think this is the next generation of the way resident training is going to occur. And there's a lot of, you know, support behind this, not, not just uh, in resident uh, simulation for neurosurgery, but orthopedic surgery, general surgery, because with increasing oversight and decreasing hours, we need ways to get residents more experience. And virtual reality is the best way that we know of to simulate a particular situation, in this case, simulate an operation with zero risk and in a repeatable fashion. Problem number four, patients do not understand DICOM images. This is just gonna show a video of one of our patients. On Monday, June 5th, 2017, I felt the worst headache in my life, like an ice pick driving through my skull. A CAT scan revealed a bleed in the side of my head, the size of a softball. The only option to stop the bleed was to have a craniotomy to remove it. Being completely out of control is terrifying. It's difficult to talk to patients about brain surgery because it's very abstract. We're combining delivering difficult news about a scary diagnosis with the additional fear of not knowing what to expect and not being able to understand what it is I'm explaining to them. When we show them the model, when they fly inside their own brain, they can see the structures. They can see the tumor, they can see the aneurysm. This device creates an experience for the patient where nothing is unknown anymore. I'm not a doctor, so I couldn't understand what they were trying to tell me because I had never physically seen a craniotomy before. It's so hard to wrap your head around what they're about to do. When I put on the goggles, my surgeon asked me if I was ready to fly. In the moments where they were telling me really terrifying things, I also felt a little bit of peace from the way that it was being presented. I was able to, in real time, see inside my brain. I was physically there with them, looking at exactly what they were trying to communicate. Before surgical theater, preparing for surgery was literally me sitting over a cup of coffee, kind of thinking, okay, I'm gonna do this, and then I remember that the optic nerve is here. But those preparations were a kind of ad lib. Now, with 360-degree 3D reconstructions, we're able to be inside that environment, which is as close to brain surgery as we can actually get without being there in the operating room. The advantage that the virtual planning and rehearsal brings to our readiness for surgery is the ability to simulate multiple different approaches. In a real patient, we don't get to try that more than once. We only get one shot at it. In the virtual model, we can do two plans, three plans, five plans, and see which one is the best for the individual patient. You make the bone look a little more like bone, so it's not translucent at first. Now that I can see the frontal sinus, I'm planning it, you know, if I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's bring in the microscope. When we're in the operating room and we get to the time of surgery, because we've done the pre-operative rehearsal, it kind of feels like deja vu, like, okay, I've been here before, I know where the important structures are gonna be. Here, here we are, we're coming up to the back of the tumor right here. This would be a good place to do an overlay. It makes the tumor more translucent. I was at the hospital in the ICU for 10 days, and I had two angiograms, two MRIs, two CAT scans, and a craniotomy. I had a risk of having epileptic seizures for the rest of my life, not knowing that I'd ever be able to drive a car again, that I would ever be able to run again. But I would say the biggest testament to how everything went was the fact that I'm sitting here today. It was nothing short of a miracle. It made me more grateful for each and every moment that we have. We experience life in three dimension. Why should our medical care be any different? 
the last part there where she says, you know, we experience life in three dimension. Why should our medical care be any different? I mean, to me, that says it all. The patients do not understand DICOM images. You show them, a, you know, a, a, an axial section of a brain and they think it looks like a Rorschach blot. Is it a butterfly or is it two witches kissing? Um, when we, and this is something we've actually studied at my institution, uh, a, a study of a 200, more than 250 patients, uh, which showed a significant improvement as compared to consultations with traditional DICOM imaging, consultations using virtual reality uh, led to a significant improvement in patient level of understanding. So down here in the black, their level of understanding in black was, was uh, before their VR consultation and in white was after. So 80% of patients after the VR consultation rating their level of understanding of their planned brain surgery as a 10 out of 10. What this also led to is a significant improvement in patient conversion. Prior to using this technology, more than a third of my patients that I recommended surgery to were leaving our institution and going up to UCLA or Cedars because they you know, thought that they were gonna get better care there. After implementing this, the patients still shop. They still go up there and get an opinion, but they end up coming back because they felt so much more educated. They felt so much of a higher level of understanding and a higher level of comfort after experiencing the consultation in virtual reality. This also led to a significant improvement in HCAP scores, which obviously is important for the hospitals nowadays. So 97% after the VR rating their hospital 9 or 10 out of 10, 97% saying definitely yes, they would recommend their doctor, and 100% saying that this kind of technology is important to them uh, in, in selecting a hospital. Problem statement number five, and this is the last one. Traditional navigation requires the surgeon to divert their attention away from the operative field. This is a traditional navigation system. This is how it, it hasn't really changed much since 1987 when it was introduced. I mean, it works on an infrared camera, it's fixed in 3D space. But as we know, what this requires is for us to put the probe in, stop what we're doing, look over at the, at the screen, figure out where the X and Y point is that represents the tip of the probe, figure out, reconstruct that X and Y point into a three-dimensional point that's relevant for the anatomy in front of us, and then turn our attention back to the operative microscope. I use the analogy of this is how we used to navigate in cars. We used to have to stop driving, pull over the car, find where we were on the map, figure out where we wanted to go, figure out how to get there, and then go back to driving. We don't do that anymore in cars. Now we have heads up display navigation that guides us, turns left here, turn right here. This is going to be an accident in this many feet ahead. Why do we not do that in neurosurgery? Why are we still interrupting our workflow? We get frustrated when the scrub tech hands us the instrument upside down or hands us that a little bit too short or too long for us to be able to use it because it requires us to divert our attention away from the operative field. Now, the traditional navigation still requires that. I have to look away from the surgical field to see where I am in the surgical field. So with augmented reality, it allows the surgeons not only to maintain focus on the surgical field, but allows us to have increased spatial awareness and see what we cannot see. So on the left, this is a clinoidal meningioma. It's very difficult to see, but the carotid artery is actually running through this as well as the optic nerve. When you turn on the AR, I can see the shell of the tumor. I can see exactly where the carotid artery is, the left optic nerve, the right optic nerve, which is trailing off you know, underneath here. So what, just by the tap of a foot pedal, I can introduce this heads up display, three-dimensional spatial awareness in order to allow me to continue the operation without interrupting my flow. So the advantages of augmented reality, this is another case with two uh, metastatic tumors located near the superior sagittal sinus. You can see the outline of the sinus here we've clipped into. These surface veins, obviously, which we wanted to avoid in selecting our corridor, and the outline of the tumor very clearly in relation to the brain, in relation to the tractography, in relation to the surface veins. So the ability to see these right, without taking my eyes off the patient allows me to maintain focus, it improves surgical workflow. It prevents what we call context switching, which is kind of going back and forth between two-dimensional axial and microscope. Switch, that switching back and forth increases the cognitive load. Even for surgeons that are extremely knowledgeable of anatomy, which we all strive to be, there's an increased spatial awareness, again, because this isn't an anatomical model. This is a specific reconstruction of this patient's three-dimensional anatomy. This is an example of using this technology in an endoscopic case. So on the left side of the screen, you're gonna see a live view of the 
uh, of the patient with the endoscope. On the right side is the endoscopic augmented reality image, which are synchronized together to provide me the heads up display. So as we drive the scope down the nose, you can see on the left side, you can't really see the tumor. On the right, you can not only see where the tumor is, you can also see where the optic nerves are, including this supracellar component, which is kind of extending up and displacing the optic chiasm. As we work on the right side of the screen, you can see I'm fading the opacity of the augmented reality in and out in order to show me exactly where I am. As I'm opening the dura, I'm tailoring my opening of the dura to be close to where the lateral borders of the tumor are. So if it's a smaller tumor, I'll, I'll make a smaller dural opening. If it's a larger tumor, obviously I'll make a, a wider window. In this case, as I kind of place my cuts, I also want to make sure I'm not, you know, know exactly where the carotid arteries are. Of course, we use Doppler vessel probe to verify, but the augmented reality is another way for us to tell where these critical structures are without when, even when we can't see them during surgery. Now, as I'm dissecting up around the surface of the tumor and maintaining this pseudo capsular plane, I'm able to, again, have this spatial awareness all while maintaining my eyes on the operative field. Those of you that do pituitary surgery know that it's relatively challenging to get the, the uh, probe up into certain positions in the nose because of the line of sight of the, uh, of the uh, navigation probe. However, with this, with the AR, with the heads up display, I can have always eyes on the patient and know where those critical structures are throughout the entire course of the dissection. Here we are now peeling the tumor down uh, away from the normal gland above. And as we remove the tumor, we can then simulate removal of the tumor uh, on, the right, on the right side in the, on the AR image to kind of catch us up in the model with, with where we are with the dissection. So that it becomes increasingly relevant as, the, as the, the rest of the tumor is removed to kind of move forward through. So as we looking now, we can see this little bubble of tumor that was extending up between the optic nerves. And although in the live image, I can't see where the optic nerves are, I know exactly where they are because of the AR image on the right. So it gives me that increased degree of confidence while being able to re resect the rest of the tumor and maintain eyes on the patient. So this is a, just a, you know, side by side. This is reality, tr tr traditional endoscopic view, 4K, 3D, doesn't show 3D on the screen, but it is. And this is the augmented reality view, showing where the optic chiasm is, where the ACAs are, where in this case, the, the carotid artery was displaced to the left and anteriorly. So very important for me to know that as I'm kind of opening up and doing my exposure to know this knuckle of tumor extending in and down and anterior and, and eroding through the anterior wall, of the cavernous sinus, this three-dimensional spatial awareness. And even you can see through where the posterior pituitary is. So the, like in order to avoid diabetes insipidus, not I know generally where it is. I know in this patient exactly where it is at all times during the operation. This is a study from Mount Sinai looking uh, at a series of 134 cases uh, using this technology uh, and the variety of, of, of uh, pathologies that they use. Um, and across both residents and faculty, the surgeons felt more comfortable uh, resecting more tissue. They felt more comfortable with the anatomy uh, because they were able to maintain their eyes on the, the patient, which also improves the surgical efficiency. Another study that which we recently published, this is using augmented reality with the microscope uh, with Stanford, Hogue, uh, GW, and several other universities, uh, demonstrating uh, the ability to use this technology to improve operative flow, to increase situational awareness, uh, and ultimately working towards improving uh, clinical outcomes, although that has yet to be proven. What about augmented reality for spine surgery? Spend the last couple of minutes on this. So, you know, there's a wide variety of technologies available for spot for uh, spinal implant placement. Still, the majority of patients, or excuse me, the majority of surgeons, meaning 65% of surgeons, either use freehand, meaning no technology at all, or fluoroscopy. About another 20% or so use navigation, and about 10% use robotics. However, augmented reality is increasingly coming into play with several companies, with Augmedics, with Surgical Theater, and others uh, developing technologies in order to help uh, bridge the gap between traditional freehand, which is again, 65% of people, because we know the accuracy of freehand placed pedicle screws is lower than if it's placed with navigation. So this is an additional, a study we uh, recently completed uh, in conjunction with uh, NYP. So with Dr. Larry Lenke uh, was the senior uh, author on this paper, uh, working with an augmented reality system uh, in order to, for, uh, for pedicle screw placement. Uh, and 
as compared to freehand, which is historically around 94% accuracy, using the augmented reality in this system led to a 99.1% accuracy for attendings and a 97.5% accuracy in the trainees. Now, in the trainees, half of the trainees were medical students with no prior experience in ever putting in a pedicle screw. So to take a technology, put it on a, someone's head for the first time and allow them to have a 97.5% level of accuracy for placing a pedicle screw when without technology, even experienced surgeons have on average 94% in over 7,000 screws, it's a pretty significant improvement. So what we're getting towards here is increasing patient safety by improving operative flow, allowing more accurate navigation and visualization of the patient's own anatomy in each specific case. This was recently published last month in, in a Neurosurgical Focus uh, and has also been presented at, uh, at multiple conferences. So putting it all together, advanced visualization, virtual reality rehearsal and intraoperative augmented reality combine in the following way. This is kind of final video to show how we put this all together. This, this is a patient that had a, a left atrial meningioma. So you can see here the 360 reconstruction, we're gonna be kind of zooming in. For some reason the video is freezing here. So zooming in on the, on the position of the uh, tumor within the left atrium there. As you can see, the optic radiations coming, uh, wrapping around. You can see that the choroidal vessels located deep to it here. Uh, on the more superficial views, you can see the uh, corticospinal tract coming down. So what we do is we build these cases from inside out. So I start deep uh, and, and build the, the surgical trajectory back from the tumor so that I can avoid the, the critical structures on the way. So as I kind of zoom back out, now I've got my surgical corridor. And what that does is helps me land on the correct sulcus in order to place my port. So you can see here I've placed markers along the sulcus, which then I'll use during the, the case in augmented reality to help place my port. So I've, this is then simulating placement of the port and making sure that I'm, I've got a good trajectory to avoid all those critical structures. Now, as we go in the surgery, this is how it looks as we're in the operation. So we simulating placement on the left with the augmented reality of the port. You can see our planned trajectory. As I'm here, I'm opening the sulcus. And now as I introduce the port, the red line is my ideal trajectory. So I'm trying to introduce the port in exact parallel or exactly in line with that red port. And you can see here, I'm about a millimeter off. So I didn't do a perfect job of this, but still it's docking it down directly on the surface of the tumor with augmented reality guidance all the way. Now, those of you that have done this, you, you know that you either have to be looking at the, at the stealth screen or at the, at, through the microscope or, or through your loops, you can't be looking at both at once. So the advantage this gives is I can look at both the brain and the navigation guidance system at the same time. And as I take the, the port out, I've landed down on the tumor. Now I can visualize the shell of the tumor and I start to see the surface of the tumor. And then I'm starting to dissect around it. Of course, as we're dissecting around it throughout the course of the operation, I'm bringing the, the augmented reality image in and out in order to kind of remind myself where the horizon of the tumor is. And those of you that do kind of this kind of surgery, you know that you know, a lot of the time you think you're further along than you are. So this is really helpful in allowing us to kind of remind me, okay, I'm only 10% around the horizon. In addition, once we get the whole thing out, we're able to kind of see there at the bottom, there's the choroidal vessels, which are preserved. And here we are pulling the remainder of the tumor away from the, the uh, attachment at the choroid and bringing it out through the tube. So then this is the post-operative, you know, excuse me, intraoperative after complete resection of the tumor, showing how the augmented reality can really help us to visualize as we remove the tube, you know, the, the minimal disruption of the, of the white matter tracts. And then this is the post-op small craniotomy. Here's the surgical tract down the, the, the path and then resection of the tumor with it maintained post-operative uh, DTI, uh, including normal function uh, of all uh, both uh, sensory and motor functions uh, after this operation. So this is uh, the other patient that we showed at the beginning. So this is that large GBM patient. Again, using the three-dimensional reconstruction with all the available image pre-operative and on the afterwards post-operative. And again, not just for the surgeon, but for 
for the patient, you can see how here, you know, just going in between the sensory and motor fibers in order to resect this tumor. And this is post-operative day three, gross total resection with a mild sensory deficit uh, and normal speech. So not only is this valuable in reinforcing that we did the right thing, but when the patient sees this, when I show them, yeah, this was your tumor before, this is you now, it just makes them feel so much more comfortable and they feel like they can kind of, you know, if they feel empowered to move on with their lives. So just as a summary, advanced visualization technologies are allowing surgeons to view images from the surgeon's perspective. They are enabling preoperative simulation for this specific patient. They are affording residents and surgeons the opportunities to practice and make mistakes safely, enhancing patients' understanding of their condition and the surgical plan. And augmented reality presents an accurate overlay of patient-specific images within the surgeon's field of view, allowing us to maintain focus on the task at hand, improving operative workflow, and ultimately working towards improved clinical outcomes. So this is the evolution of our field, 1885, Taylor Houghton lines, 1987, the MRI showing uh, and navigation with two dimensional images, 2021, surgeon's eye view with all relevant structures in a single field of view and then projected into the operative microscope in order to allow us true intraoperative guidance, just like fighter pilots have in an airplane or we have now in heads up display in a car. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate you having me here today, and I look forward to, uh, to speaking with you all soon. Thank you very much, Dr. Louis. Unfortunately, thanks, I do have to run. I've got to get my little girl to school. <laughs> thanks, th thanks, Rob. That was great. Um, great to see you again. Uh, just a quick question. Yep. Uh, what do you say to the, to the naysayers or the people that say, you know what, with stealth, I can, I can get down there just as quick. I know where the motor fibers are. This is nowhere near motor fibers in the frontal lobe or whatever. Uh, you know, why should I bother with uh, virtual or augmented reality? Thanks. I, I would say that you know you, you think you know where they are, but you know where they are based on your anatomy, like lessons from medical school and residency. I'm a neuroanatomist, and I study even variations in, in, from you know there's a 12% incidence of this variation or a 10% incidence of that. I would say there's not a human on earth that knows where every vessel or every fiber is in an individual patient. The only way we can get that information is from a patient-specific three-dimensional reconstruction. Now, what they say is I, it's not worth taking the time to prepare. Listen, my job job is taking the time to prepare. My job isn't just to pick up the knife and get in there and cut and get down there as fast as I can. Most of my job is to prepare for surgery and plan for surgery so that when I get to surgery, I can do it to the absolute best of my technical abilities. So the, the idea that, oh, this takes extra time, that's my job is to take the extra time. So I want to know not generally where these fibers are. I want to know exactly where they are in this patient in 3D and in the position they're going to be during surgery. Great, thanks. Awesome. Thank you guys for having me. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Um, if you have time, uh, I would like to know just a little bit about the workflow actually in the operating room. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Gone, Lewis, huh? Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, gone. That was great. Very compelling uh, presentation. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.